talk I'm giving is because I, I just felt that people had forgotten, they'd lost that connection with Alfred Russell Wallace. And there's been a lot of media um, publicity recently, so a lot of people are hearing his name. There's a couple of programs made, and Bill Bailey made a program recently. But for me, I mean, my time with Russell Wallace goes back, it's been 1995, I think it is. Uh, and I, when I was in university, I had absolutely no idea who he was. But I was giving uh, one of my first big lectures, what we call the Reptile World Lectures. And I was looking to present that lecture in a, in a theatre, not too big, not too small, one of just about the right size, about 100 odd people. And there was a perfect lecture theatre there, the Wallace Lecture Theatre. I thought, oh, fabulous, okay, we'll go for that. And at the time, I had no idea who Wallace was. I wondered if he was an ex-vice-chancellor. Perhaps he could have been um, an ex-lecturer or something in Cardiff. I thought he must have some type of Welsh connection. Gave the lecture, that was fine. It was many years later that I went back to the theatre and thought, oh, I never did look up who Wallace was. And there's a little plaque in the theatre which tells you, you know, gives you a few dates, you know, born, died, and some basic information and then I, I reviewed from there and I, I was absolutely astounded. You know, here is the man, a Welsh man, who along with Darwin, who everybody knows, uh, basically came up with the, the th you know, the, the theory, the theory of evolution by natural selection. And I've always had a bit of a bee in my bonnet that more people don't know about him. So a lot of people have forgotten what this man has achieved. And I think what happened was that Alfred Russell Wallace and Darwin, they were so famous at, 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 you know, in Victorian times. The theory of evolution by natural selection sort of was almost sidelined, it sort of lost favour. And all these new wondrous things came in, mesmerism and all sort of things like this. And people sort of forgot about it. And in the 1930s, um, everyone sort of got excited about it again. There was more evidence to support the theory. And as more people supported it, it became more popular and people sort of looked back... <coughs> Excuse me. People looked back and tried to find... You know, sorry, sorry, sorry. So people looked back and they were trying to establish who came up with this theory. And I think when, yeah, this is before obviously the time of, 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 of Google and Wikipedia, so nobody could sort of look at me and go, yeah, Wallace Darwin, okay, fine, you know. So it's of the Wallace Darwin theory as it was known. People were looking back through the literature and they came up with Darwin's book on the theory of natural selection, you know. So basically, that was, this is, this is the problem. On the origin of the species was what people were referring back to the book, which was Darwin. And, of course, they would have needed to go back a couple more years to actually see who presented the theory of evolution by natural selection at the Linnaean Society of London. Um, and that was, of course, Darwin and Wallace. Same day, papers went in. And it's incredible that we've forgotten all about Alfred Russell Wallace, especially here in Wales. My grandmother bought me this little green book, the Hamlin uh, Encyclopedia of Animals. I, I, I just cannot tell you how much I love this book. I used to, this book just went everywhere with me. Uh, and I used to keep it on a shelf next to my bed. And every night I'd go to bed and I'd thumb through randomly. Yeah, it was a big book. On. Open it up and there'd be a new animal to learn about. And it, it was just magical, you know, for me, to realise that some of these animals exist, you know, echidnas and duckbill platypuses and all sorts of animals, these look so bizarre and exotic and th these magical faraway lands. I, you know, I'm there on my little council estate in Fairwater in Cardiff and here are these lands with these, you know, to me almost mythical animals. They, they may as well have been dragons, you know, they're just incredible diversity. And I just absolutely fell in love with that book. Um, and I can remember that uh, my father, um, I'd saved a pocket money and I said, I want to go out and buy something. And I think he, you know, he reluctantly took me home and 
okay, thinking I wanted to go to a sweet shop or some other like toy shop, and I didn't. Uh, I wanted to go and buy myself a globe, most important thing, so that at night I could spin the globe, look up where this animal came from, and it helped me to visualise where this animal was in the world, so I could, you know, try to correlate where all these wonderful animals were coming from, where they lived. Absolutely loved it. That. Okay, yeah, it was 30 years old when I found out that I was dyslexic. Um, relief. Because, um, yeah, it was pretty normal after all. It wasn't the fact that there was something odd about me that I couldn't spell as efficiently as the next man or woman. Um, I was quite relieved. I'd found an identity for some of the symptoms I exhibited and for some of the challenges that I faced. And it was nice to know that there were other people out there that were dyslexic. But now I had a responsibility because I already had an orange box at that time that I was stood on. And there were other little Reese's out there that were also dyslexic. And some of them were being bullied for their dyslexia. Some of them were having a challenging time. Some of them were being told that they wouldn't go any further in education. My responsibility was to stand there and say, hi, I'm dyslexic. I'm doing okay. Just believe in yourself and believe me, you'll go far. Definitely because I'm Welsh and uh, that's, I like to fight for the little man. So if you can imagine, there's lots of people uh, at the time were researching um, lovely fluffy furry or feathered things. And you had these little scaly monsters in, in Wales that hadn't had a lot of research done on them. Certainly for me, I was interested in something called phylogeography. Another direct link to Wallace, by the way, um, who was the father of biogeography and phylogeography uh, is a discipline which is directly linked um, to biogeography. And basically what I wanted to know was how, how did they get into Britain? What routes did they take through Europe? How did they deal with, uh, how did they negotiate river systems and mountain ranges and all of that can be uh, understood through understanding their genetics so you sequence the genetics and all that information is in there believe it or not um, and that was the research I did but nobody had looked at the adder the grass snake and in the south of England there's another snake called the smooth snake which not a lot of people know about um, so I incorporated all three species and looked at how they'd come in after the last ice age across Europe and into Britain. Very interested. But of course, you know, once you're in there, you're in there. And I was uh, looking through all the poo samples and the parasites and uh, found a new parasite in, in uh, living here in Wales that we didn't know was here, uh, a, a roundworm in, in, that was living in the guts of these, these animals and all sorts of things. And, you know, that's the thing with science. You start looking at one thing and then all of a sudden, there's all these other wonderful things to look at. Some of the things you can expect this year, um, I get called in, we've got uh, an otter which dies in very mysterious circumstances and we've got to, you know, it's, it's like CSI otter basically, we've got to reconstruct how this otter died and why it died. It's a European protected species, we've got to make sure that we understand what's going on with this. We've got um, some amazing footage of me in Africa working with my rhino, which I've been doing for many, many years. And we've got an incredible piece of research that we're doing to try and protect the black rhino into the future. And it's incredible. Uh, in addition to that, I get called in to identify a mummy. So I've got like a 3,000 year old mummy, and I've got to try and identify without damaging this mummy. 
what's inside this sort of embalmed um, case and we work it out and it's it's good science you know it's a great mix of science uh, with wildlife crime and with just conventional rescues you know as well like rescuing a couple of damsels in distress when they find a giant spider on their roof that type of thing